for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here today. Uh, so let's talk about some ice sheets. Um, so I'm going to be starting out today uh, covering some of the climate context of these measurements and these observations that we're going to be making. Uh, I'm going to spend some time talking about how we make these observations and how they've really improved in the last decade compared to some of the older measurements. Uh, there's going to be a little math section about some of the techniques that we use. Um, it's necessary, but it is short. So if you're going to take a nap during this talk, this is the, the choice time to do that. Um, so then we're going to talk about the solid earth and how the solid earth impacts with the climate system and some of the changes that we have to be aware of, the influence of the solid earth. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about the cryosphere and, and specifically what sort of mass changes we see in ice sheets. Uh, and so you can see the little color bar at the top so you can follow along uh, as we go through. So uh, the motivation for this work is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, it's rare that I can tell a layperson what I'm doing and they totally understand why. Um, so uh, here we have a, a graph. This is time on the bottom, and this is CO2. Uh, parts per million in the atmosphere. And so the basic story is that over the past 150, 200 years, we've been burning a lot of fossil fuel and we've been emitting a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. And I'm just going to mention carbon, uh, even though that there are other greenhouse gases and other forcings, etc. And so basically, as we've been changing the composition of our atmosphere, we've been changing the temperature, the average surface temperature of our atmosphere as well. And so you can see that basically, as we've been emitting CO2 and emitting carbon into the atmosphere, the temperature has gone up. And so over the next 100 years, we have a pretty good idea that both of these things are going to continue. So for instance, uh, this orange line that comes up is an IPCC scenario where we basically do business as usual. Where we don't really make a lot of mitigation in terms of our carbon emissions. The second line here, the green line, is sort of the temperature rise that goes along with that. And so we're expected, uh, in the past 150 years, we've had about 0.8 uh, uh, degrees C of warming, and we're expected over the next 100 to have roughly 3.5 degrees of C on average warming. And so the important point that I want to make about this context is that yeah, the globe is warming in a globally average sense, but the warming that we see is not uniform by any means. And so, in particular, the land masses and the Arctic areas and the Antarctic areas are going to have increased warming compared to average. And so these are really areas where we have land ice and we have these really large land ice sheets. And so having a good observational record of what these ice sheets are doing 
currently is going to allow us to have a projection of what they're doing in the future and have a projection of how sea level is going to vary in response to ice sheet changes in the future. So that's really why uh, we're doing this work and I find it pretty exciting. So there have been a couple ways that we measure these ice sheets. The two that I'm going to be talking about, the two ice sheets that I'm going to be talking about today are, are basically Greenland and Antarctica. And so Greenland is a land ice sheet and upwards of three kilometers thick in some regions. And so uh, it's different than the sea ice. I'm not going to be talking about sea ice today. But uh, if you were to melt all of Greenland, you'd get roughly about seven meters of sea level rise. Antarctica, on the other hand, is very different. It's much, much bigger. It's about twice the size of Australia. And so if you actually over here is West Antarctica, and this is roughly about the size of Greenland. So if you mount West Antarctica, you get roughly about seven meters of sea level rise as well. The East, uh, the East Antarctica ice sheet over here is actually much, much bigger, and, and in most cases is thicker, uh, you know, up to four kilometers in, in excess of that. And so if you melt the whole of Antarctica at once, you get about 70 meters of sea level rise. And as you continue to melt these in the future, we would see additional sea level rise. And so understanding those changes is going to be really important for how sea level varies over the next 100 years. Um, so there's been a couple ways that we measure these ice sheets. Uh, two of the big techniques, uh, laser and radar altimetry, these missions begin to come online in the early 90s and the mid 90s. So basically, as the satellite flies over an ice sheet, it's going to send down a laser and measure that reflection. So the observation that you get is an elevation change of that ice sheet. Um, another way that we do this is with satellite gravity. So here's a picture of Earth's gravity field. And depending on the land masses, you have areas where gravity is higher than average and areas where gravity is lower than average. So this unit here is milligals. A milligal is a millionth of g, so it's a millionth of the gravity that we experience day to day. And so this is, the field varies on the order of, of plus or minus 50 uh, millionths of the average value. And so the way that we measure this with satellites is that as a satellite passes over something that's, that's more dense, or perhaps as a mountain chain, the, the, the mass anomaly is going to perturb the orbit of the satellite. And so by measuring the changes in the satellite orbit, you can get a pretty good idea of what the gravity field looks like. And so these gravity missions started going up a little earlier. The, some of the first ones were the Lagio satellites in the 70s. And this was kind of cool because it was about a, a half meter size ball that's just full of uh, corner cubes. And you, you, lay, you shoot lasers off of it and measure the reflection. And so you can detect changes in the orbit of the satellite uh, that way. Uh, some of the later satellites also did this. And the, the thing to take away from these is that the, the orbit altitude of the satellite is proportional to the resolution of the gravity field that you can get. So when you send something that's really high up in orbit, like the Lagio satellites, you get a really <coughs> low resolution image of the gravity field. And as you send a satellite that's lower in altitude, you can get a finer resolution picture of the gravity field. So one of the big boons in this area was the GRACE satellites, which were launched in 2003. And so the, the GRACE mission was pretty cool because it was actually two satellites, and they follow each other in orbit. And so the, the observation that you get in this case is a range and a range rate between the two satellites. And so the position of the satellites, you can uh, figure out what that is from GPS, from the range to the other satellite, and the range to the ground. And so it's a much lower altitude, so it's orbiting every 90 minutes. It's only about 300 kilometers on average in altitude. And it was actually a hugely successful mission from a science perspective. So we're building another one, and we're sort of hoping that this one limps along to until 2016, until we launch the next one, that we can actually keep a, a consistent time series. So this went up in 2003. We have roughly about 10 years of data out of it. So we have a, a good picture of the gravity field over the last decade. 
So the way this works is kind of similar, uh, except that you just have two satellites. So as you pass over some mass anomaly in the Earth, the first satellite gets there first, and it senses uh, that mass change, and so its orbit changes. So the distance between the two satellites will increase or decrease depending on the sign of that mass anomaly. And so then they're, they're separated in orbit by about 300 degrees, and then the second satellite comes on, comes along, and it is influenced by that mass anomaly. And so you have this, this uh, really high frequency time series of the range and range rate between these two satellites. Um, so as I said, GRACE was really successful. Uh, this is a picture of the static gravity field. So on the left is basically what the, the static gravity field looked like from satellite data prior to GRACE. And so, as I said, those, those missions were generally higher orbit, so they're a lower resolution picture. On the right is what you get if you sum four years of GRACE data to form a static field. And so you can really see that the, our picture of the gravity field has improved from a satellite perspective. And so you can start to see a lot more detail in the Tibetan Plateau. You can see the gravity changes associated with subduction zones uh, in the Western Pacific. You can get a clear picture of, of the Andes now. Um, obviously, we had some land-based measurements to complement the satellite data. But uh, now we have a much better picture of those long wavelength, uh, low order terms. But the, the really interesting part of GRACE is that it's making such a clear picture of the gravity field that you can actually do time variable problems. So you can say, I'm going to take uh, one month's worth of orbits, and I'm going to sum them and, and make a gravity field. So I have a picture of what the gravity field looks like at any given month. And then I have a time series of how that gravity field varies over time. Uh, and so the, the maps that we produce are in spheric harmonics. So they're global fields. They're distributed up to a certain band limit uh, of spheric harmonics. And so this is an example between October and April of 2009, where it's a six month time scale. And so the differences that you see in this image are at this time scale, basically water storage uh, on the surface of the Earth. So you see really strong signals in Southeast Asia associated with uh, seasonal monsoon cycles. You see really strong water storage in the Amazon basin as that goes through a rainy and a dry season, uh, similar with Africa. Uh, and so there's been a whole lot of hydro hydrologic work uh, to study these seasonal signals, study these water storage uh, problems. And so my work is really looking into how the cryosphere can be measured with this. So this is great. We have a global field of gravity every month, and we can look at the time series of this field. The problem comes really when you want to look at specific regions, because that's where all the geophysically interesting stuff is going on. Right? If I'm going to look at Greenland ice sheet, then I have to look at a subset of the field at Greenland. And spheric harmonics are really great for distributing a global field, but they're not really so great when you want to localize and look at just a specific area. For one thing, on the sphere, spheric harmonics are orthogonal. So the, the, the products here, the, the integration of those cross products between the spheric harmonics form a delta function. But on a specific region like Greenland, that's no longer true. And so you start having signal leakage where the signal appears in different areas. Um, you also have similar problems if you try to do some work in the pixel basis, for instance. So our method basically is saying, when I, when I make these products of spherical harmonics and I integrate them on the, a specific region like Greenland, I'm going to get a big matrix with off-diagonal terms. And I can use that information to create new basis functions that just tell me about Greenland. Um, and so they're going to be built from the eigenvalues, basically, of this new matrix. And these are called Slepian functions. So as I said, we have this kernel. We're going to call it the localization kernel. And it's basically formed by the, instead of the delta functions, it's formed by the junk that you get when you, when you limit square harmonics just to a specific area. So we basically set it up just as an eigenvalue problem where you're taking a, a decomposition of that matrix, and the eigenfunctions that you get are going to be your new basis functions. Uh, and 
And so these new functions are both orthogonal on the sphere and they're orthogonal on the region. So you sort of get rid of those problems that you have initially when you look at uh, a specific region. So the, the eigenvalue that you get out of this problem tells you how concentrated these functions are. So the whole idea is you want to concentrate a function in a specific area. So you get an eigenvalue between 0 and 1. And so if it's 1, it's 100% concentrated in my region. And if it's 0, then it's, it spreads its energy elsewhere on the globe. So the, the dimension of this new basis is basically the Shannon number. Uh, and, and it's a function of the area that I'm looking at and the band limit of the data that I have. So it's just a function of L and A here, which is just the spherical area. So you're concentrating data into a localized sparse basis. And you can think of it uh, this way, is that I have the whole globe, and I'm only interested in a specific part, so I just want to look at Greenland. And that is a small percentage of the globe. So it makes sense that I look at an equally small percentage of the data in order to look at what's going on in Greenland. I don't want to look at the whole sphere of data if I only want a specific area. So We've taken a spherical field, which has like 3,700 coefficients to it, and we projected that into a basis which only has 20 functions for Greenland. And here's what they look like. So in this case, the basis that we made is only uh, three different parameters, and one of them is standard. So we're only looking at Greenland. We have a specific band limit of the data, so this is spherical degree. 60, that's the max. And then the truncation, which we're, we're using the Shannon number, so it's uh, it's uh, a point where you get the mean squared error of the, the projection. But So the first function here is a function that has almost all of its energy, nearly 100%, within Greenland. The 12th function of this basis is 87% concentrated. So 87% of its energy is in Greenland, and then uh, you know like 13% outside of that. And so you form this basis, and different sets of these functions give you different information. So here's an example of this, a, a similar basis for Western Antarctica, where we have this, we're essentially localizing on this dotted line and creating functions that exist in that region. And so the, the whole thing is that we want estimates of the total mass change in a region, and we want a picture of what that mass change looks like. And so with this uh, method, you're able to get basically better estimates of those quantities. And we want to, we really want to make sure that we do a good job of keeping an idea of the error. So as I said, we have a time series. So these are what these coefficients look like over time. So this is uh, from 2002 to, in this case, 2011. And you have each of these dots is a month, uh, a, a grace month field. And so these are all in surface density which is a kilogram per square meter. And so it's pretty straightforward in, in most of these cases just to fit uh, a simple function, a line or a quadratic to that. Um, and it's really easy to like know what the variance is on these estimates and know how they co-vary between each other. Because it, it's something that's been a little bit ignored in previous estimates, uh, exactly how this error comes into play. And so the, the traditional thing is that you assume that the covariance matrix is just diagonal, so that the terms aren't uh, don't covary between each other. And so on the right, you can sort of see what that gets you. This is the, the covariance of other points with a single point in the middle of Greenland or in a single point in Western Antarctica. And so you'd expect that nearby points are kind of correlated, and, and faraway points are not. But th this is from a covariance matrix that was generated from the data, and you can see that there are broad areas of the globe that would be correlated with Greenland that you totally would not expect them to be. And so if you have this information, you can make a better estimate. Um, so as I said, uh, back to this, we can fit a simple line to this uh, quadratic function or, or what have you, and, and we have an estimate of surface density. So one way to do it would be to make a lot of these functions fit them, sum them together, and then you get a map of surface density. Uh, so we're actually making estimates on the individual coefficients. A different way to do it is to take all the coefficients times their function 
and then integrate them in space. And in this case, you get a mass estimate. So the difference here in this graph that I'm going to be showing is that it's in mass. It's in, uh, well, it's in gigatons, which is just a billion tons, which is a billion thousand kilograms. And so instead, you could fit a line to this if you wanted. So the techniques are, are very slightly different, but in both cases, we want to know the uncertainty on those estimates. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the solid earth and how the solid earth really impacts the geoid. Because we have a strong influence from the solid earth on these measurements and we want to know that so that we can understand and correct for that. So I have sort of four quick examples on how the solid earth impacts this and uh, I'm going to step through them. So the first thing is that we have a response of the earth to current melting. So as you pull some melting off the ice sheet, you get an elastic response of the Earth as it rebounds. And so you need to correct for that. So for instance, this is a synthetic. I don't know if you could, it's a little hard to see these coastlines. But we put a, a synthetic surface density anomaly in South, South America. And then the geoid response that you would observe from that is both a combination of that surface density and of the Earth response. And so the, the geoid here is, is much more broad uh, because it involves a, a much more broader elastic response of the Earth. And so we basically correct for this by using uh, like loading love numbers in order to uh, jump between the geoid and actually surface density. It, it corrects for that. So a second example that we look at is the ongoing response viscously from past deglaciation. So over the last 20,000 years, we've removed a lot of ice from the Arctic and the Antarctic, and the Earth is currently responding viscously to that. Um, and so we have to create a model for what that response is today, and then remove that. And so these are two examples. They're basically done as forward models. We say, I have an ice loading history. This is over here on the left. This is time, and basically ice volume on the y-axis. And so there's, there's different ice unloading histories that you can use. And then there's also a different Earth rheology that you can assume uh, in these models. And so that's basically why you get different map patterns uh, between the models. So these are two common ones we do. We use both of them because we want to see the difference between different corrections. And uh, yeah, so that's something that we need to be aware of and something that we need to correct for in our data. Um, so you can imagine, let me go back one sec, you can imagine that if you have different Earth models for this, you're going to get very different pictures of the viscous response. And so uh, mantle viscosity is quite important in that uh, part. So this is can some work. Can I ask, sorry, yeah. can I ask a question on that last slide? Yeah. Why is it that the higher viscosity mantle profile is creating the larger response? So if you have a lower mantle viscosity, let's say you have the same loading history. If you have a lower mantle viscosity, then the response from that loading history is going to occur more quickly. And so what's happening today is going to be, uh, oh, you're asking the opposite question. So you're asking why these are bigger. Yeah. These have, yeah. So these have a larger mantle viscosity. Yeah. 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 So if you have a lower viscosity, the effect is going to happen quicker. And so we're going to be seeing the tail end of that today. Oh, so it's just a matter of the time that's passed. Yeah, yeah. So if you have a okay. if you have a really high mantle viscosity, then the very oh, beginning of that effect is going to be, yeah. Thanks. So that, I, I mixed them up in my head when I was uh, saying that. So, uh, mantle viscosity is quite important to this. So uh, I've done some work in the past trying to estimate mantle viscosity. So this was one example where we wanted to use the motion of continental keels through the mantle to try and estimate uh, how they perturb the pressure field. So they would perturb the pressure field in the same way that you move a ship through water. So you have a high pressure gradient at the front of that ship, and so you get positive dynamic topography that lifts the front of a ship, and you get a negative pressure and a negative dynamic topography on the tail end. And so we wanted to see if, if, if keels did the same thing when they moved through the mantle. So the example that we used was just Australia here. 
And we wanted to see, is that effect large enough, and can we use it to constrain mantle viscosity by comparing it to the current gravity field? And so this was basically uh, a set of experiments that we did. This is transition zone viscosity versus upper, man upper mantle viscosity. And actually, yeah, you can use that as an independent constraint on what mantle viscosity is. And it's great because it's different than all the other methods, and it sort of gives you some new information on how accurate those methods are. So the, the last thing that I want to mention really quick is about geoid kernels. So if you imagine some density in the mantle that wants to sink, as that sinks, it's going to generate flow in the mantle. And that flow is going to perturb the surface and the CMB. And so the, the geoid expression that you see in the gravity field at the surface is a combination of that density anomaly and of the flow that that density anomaly, anomaly generates. So uh, a geoid kernel is basically just a sensitivity kernel that expresses that fact in the geoid. So if you have an estimate of the density and you make an estimate of how the flow how that density drives flow, you can make an estimate on what the geoid should look like. And you can use that con to constrain either density or earth rheology. And so this, some of this work was done in the late 80s, early 90s, and what we've done is be able to combine this work with Slepian functions. And so now what we have is a localized version of this kernel. And so this is work that I'm sort of just doing now. And so these are basically sensitivity kernels where We've localized in this region by these black bars, and we want to say, like, what's the sensitivity of some part of the geoid with depth? And so you have some depth sensitivity, you have some lateral variation sensitivity. And so we could just begin to ask questions. Um, if I'm looking at a specific region, like Africa, for instance, what is the best mantle rheology beneath Africa that explains the geoid above Africa? So you can ask these questions on a regional scale instead of on a global scale. Um, so let's start talking about the cryosphere and sort of apply all this stuff that we've talked about to ice sheets. Uh, so Greenland, we started having really good measurements in the 90s, as I said, when these altimetry missions went out. And so the data you get from altimetry is really great because it's a small footprint measurement so you can make really good maps. Um, you sort of have to average uh, a couple years in order to get enough repeat measurements over the surface. And they're sort of less accurate for giving you the total mass, because they have to make a, a strong assumption between that, that the elevation change you observe is related to a mass change and not a density change of the ice sheet. So GRACE sort of tells you the opposite of that. It's, it's really great at these mass estimates, because that's what it's measuring. But up until recently, it's been not so great at making maps. So that's really what we wanted to concentrate on. Can we do both of these things well? Um, so this was the results that we had a couple years ago that we've updated. So basically, the localization region that we're looking at is within this dotted line. This includes Greenland and it includes Ellesmere Island up here where you have some mountain glaciers. And basically what we see, this is the, the total that's changed over the last 10 years. You see there's really two strong areas where you have a lot of uh, mass melting, or ice melting. So red areas are here where we've been losing mass, so we've been melting ice. So it's basically two areas on the southeast coast and on the northwest coast. And these are areas which have a really high concentration of outlet glaciers. And so those glaciers have been accelerating over the past 10 years, and so we've seen, been seeing a lot of uh, mass discharge from them. Uh, also over here, we have an estimate of the total mass, so basically uh, the integral of this over the region that we're looking at. And so uh, in this case, there's been about 290 gigatons, it's 290 billion tons of ice on average being lost every year. And it's accelerating quite a bit, so it's about um, 30 gigatons per year per year. <coughs> and so it's basically doubled over the last six or seven years or so. And in particular, the last few years have been really melting quite a bit. So in the, in the past few years, we've been upwards of 400 billion tons that have been coming off the ice sheet. And 
it's kind of a weird number to think about. You, I, I, I imagine a lot of people don't have an image in their head of what a billion tons look like. So if you have 400 billion tons coming off of Greenland, and you wanted to fill the District of Columbia with that amount of ice, it's about two and a half kilometers worth of ice that you're shoving into the District of Columbia. So it's about 15 times the height of the Washington Monument, and that's the amount that's coming off every year. So every year you're having a new District of Columbia, which is as thick as the Laurentide ice sheet was in some places. Yeah, so they have a little uh, slight accumulation. And so it's, it's not really, we're not really sure how correct this is. Because on one hand, uh, as you warm the atmosphere, it's going to hold more moisture, and it's going to allow more snow to get to the high elevations. But on the other hand, uh, it's, some people say it's in the altimetry data, and some people say it is not. So we're not really sure if it shows up in other data yet. Um, so in addition to looking at the whole thing that's changed over the last 10 years, we can do like a year-by-year -year slice and see how that map pattern has changed. So up here in the top left, we have 2003, and then going down here until 2012. And so the, the general pattern that you see is that in the early parts of this 10-year span, you have a lot of melting on the southeast coast. So uh, basically here, here, here. And then starting in 2006 and 2007, you start seeing a lot more mass loss in the northwest area. And we have also a lot of glaciers. And so that's up here, that's over here, over here. And then really in the last two years, you've had sort of broad areas where you're losing mass over the southern half of Greenland. And you can see that, that this, this is the integral of this field. So this is in gigatons. So it's we started out at about 130, middle, middle hundreds, and now we're up to over 400 gigatons. So these maps are actually in surface density change. Uh, it's, it's just a way of expressing kilograms per square meter as the equivalent of water. So, so this would be like if I had 10 centimeters of water that I got rid of from this square meter. So these mass loss rates, how long will Greenland ice cap last? Uh, okay. So at this rate, if you just go by the slope, it would be quite long. It would be a couple thousand years. If you actually use the acceleration, you project the acceleration forward, it's only about 600 years. Uh, but it's a, we don't have a long enough record to really project that acceleration forward because we, we don't have an idea of how this varies on a decadal time scale. So, yeah, so it's really important that we keep measuring this to see how that varies in the next decade. Um, so one of the interesting things here is that you can see a strong seasonal cycle in Greenland. So you can see there are definitely months where we're losing all of this mass, and then there's another time period where we're sort of either not losing mass or we're gaining a little mass. And so one of the projects that we, we started to look at was really the seasonal cycle in Greenland. And so this is work that we started with Mike Bevis at Ohio State because he started installing a GPS network around Greenland. And so you can see here, these are basically the, all the stations that he has up now, and these are some of the older stations. And so what you can notice, these are ordered basically by uh, latitude. So you can notice uh, maybe not from the back, but you could see that the seasonal pattern is different in different places around Greenland. And so they, in, in this paper from 2012, they sort of did uh, a whole Greenland average seasonal cycle and what that looks like. And so what we really want to do now is see how the seasonal cycle varies in different places. So this is basically a picture of what that looks like for each month of the year, uh, January down to December. And so the first thing you notice is that there's really strong uh, changes in certain months. So there's basically between August and October, you get that's when most of the mass loss happens. And then there's a time period during the winter where you're actually accumulating some of that back. But the important thing is that this doesn't happen at the same time. At, in the, it doesn't happen around the ice sheet at the same time. 
it, it has different lags in different areas, and so the northern half is going to do different parts than the southern half. And now that we have a really great GPS network there, we can do some of that comparison and see how the, the GPS compares to a seasonal grace cycle. Uh, so that's some of the work that we just started. Uh, but let's sort of shift and start talking about Antarctica. So Antarctica, we had sort of a, a pretty good idea that the middle parts of Antarctica don't do a whole lot. They have low elevation change and they have low ice flow velocities. And so really the, the main elevation changes are near the coast and, and the main uh, ice speeds that you see in Antarctica. So this is a radar, uh, in, an INSAR image of Antarctica, and this is an altimetry study from a few years ago. And really there's a couple places where we see this really big mass change. So we see on the, the coast of West Antarctica here, uh, some on the peninsula and other areas around the coast. But the argument that I'm going to try and make to you today is that Antarctica is so large that, that different parts of it do different things and you really should be looking at them separately instead of looking at all of Antarctica. So, but, but we did start with all of Antarctica because that's what everybody else does. So we made this picture by localizing on all of Antarctica at once. And so basically it's this dashed line here. It includes grounded ice. It sort of gets rid of the ice sheets which are floating. They don't really contribute to the gravity field. And so you can see that there's a, a couple areas that we know now we want to look at further. So the first is Western Antarctica. There's, there's one major area, that's the Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites Glacier area that's melting, uh, that's discharging a lot of ice. Uh, further areas along the coast we want to look at as well. There's been some mass loss in the peninsula, we want to look there, see what that's done. And then there's been some accumulation in air parts of East Antarctica. So we want to look at those and see how those are different from the other areas. So we're going to step through sort of these areas and, and see what they're doing on this decadal time scale. And I should point out that the, the scale bar here is a little shifted. So these blues are, basically the blues are exaggerated so that you can show them on the same plot as the reds. So this is the graph that you see if you do all of Antarctica at once. It's basically this, this red area here. And you can see that it has a nice trend, but it's kind of variable about that trend. And it sort of bounces around a lot of the place. And so the error bar that we get is pretty good, but it's not really great. And so we wanted to see, can we also improve on that when we do like different areas around Antarctica? Uh, so it's also melting quite a bit. It's accelerating quite a bit. It's doubled in the last five years. Um, we really want to look in the next decade to see if this continues. So the first area that we're going to look at is Western Antarctica. So it's basically going to be this uh, A box here that we're looking at. And so this A box is the same as this. And so the new area that we're looking at is just the localization in this dashed line. And again, this is 2003 down to 2012. And what you can really see is that there's uh, the, the Pine, Island, Pine Island and Thwaites Glacier area is basically right here, right there. And so that's an area that started melting, uh, started discharging a lot of ice uh, pretty recently, or over the last 20, 30 years. And so you can see that that area in particular has been accelerating. And so it's getting more red in these figures. One of the worrisome things is that further areas down the coast of Western Antarctica are starting to melt more ice. And so these are areas that haven't been accelerating if you look at altimetry data or radar data. but has started to discharge more ice. And so we want to, we're a little worried that this is going to pick up and it's, it's, it's going to be discharging uh, a lot more ice in the future. And there's a, so there's a little blue spot here. This is from the Kamai stream. This is pretty well known. There's a, the Kamai stream became blocked about 75, 100 years ago. And so there's been some ice that's been piling up uh, in that area, which shows up as mass accumulation. Do you know if the ice is, I mean, if you're losing mass as carving of ice, or is it actually melting? So the air temperature is not warm enough to melt surface ice. So in Greenland, it, it's 
we think it's roughly a 50-50 split between ice discharge and surface melt. But in Antarctica, it's not warm enough. So you have, it's basically all flux across the grounding line. So grounded ice becomes floating ice. But the ocean is warm enough to melt ice. So you're melting the base of these ice shelves, these floating ice shelves. So as you continue to melt there, you're essentially removing some of the buttressing on the ice uh, on the glacier, and so more can come across the grounding line. So if you look at the, the graph for just this region, you get a, a starker view of the mass loss and the acceleration. So the mass loss we're getting here is a good 30 gigatons higher, because this is basically where it's coming from in Antarctica. And this is basically where it's accelerating as well. This is most of the acceleration. And so the, the signal that we get by projecting this data into a small basis gives you a much better signal to noise. And so we're able to measure this much better than with other methods. So it's this, just this red region here. Uh, and right, so we have these increased losses in, along other coastal areas that we want to keep watch on. So next area we're going to look at is the peninsula. Uh, so that's this box B here, is this area in here. And the peninsula is kind of an interesting area because it, it's sort of a tale of two halves of the peninsula. So by 2003, by the time you get this GRACE data, you already have the disintegration of some of the Larsen ice shelves. And so we've already, by that time, we've already observed the acceleration of the land glaciers uh, coming from the removal of these ice sheets that buttress them. So you can see sort of a uh, steady mass loss in the northern half of the peninsula. The southern half of the peninsula didn't really have that by the time the start of this data. And so over this time span, you can see an acceleration of the mass loss coming from the southern half of the peninsula. And we're not really sure why this is occurring, because there hasn't been really a disintegration of the ice shelves. There could have been more basal melting of them, which is causing more discharge, but we're not really sure. So it's kind of up in the air uh, what the southern half is doing. Um, but if you look at this whole area, so this is just this red area, you can see that this, on the whole, this area has been melting and has been accelerating a little bit. Um, so it's, it's not accelerating nearly as much as Western Antarctica, but, uh, and it, which is probably good. It has less ice there to begin with, uh, but it, it's still something that we want to keep an eye on. Uh, so the, the last part of Antarctica that we're going to look at is East Antarctica, which is this, going to be this C box over here. Uh, and so for this, we have this region which sort of looks like this, I don't know, sideways seven. Um, and the story of this region is kind of interesting because prior to 2009, you have basically a, a low amount of accumulation. It, it wasn't really enough to offset the losses that we had seen in Western Africa. But since 2009, uh, there's been an abrupt change in this region. And so now that the, the mass accumulation that you're seeing in this region of Eastern Antarctica is offsetting roughly about half of the melting that we're seeing in Western Antarctica. And so it's really thought that, that this is a series of precipitation events, basically a series of weather events that have come and dumped a whole lot of snow in this area. And they've con it was originally thought that this was a one-off thing or uh, you know, a couple storm thing, but really it's continued for about four years. So we don't really know if this is going to continue in the future or if it's sort of like a half decade kind of time scale, decade time scale kind of thing. So I, we put the slope and the acceleration on here, but we're not really comfortable yet fitting a single line to what look, you know, what appears to be two separate time series. Um, so in lieu of conclusions, I sort of wanted to mention what I think is still missing from this, and sort of some of the work that we still need to do. Um, so as I said, viscosity is really important to this. So one of the things we want to look at is lateral variations in Earth rheology. 
because Eastern and Western Antarctica are actually very different in their lithosphere. In Western Antarctica, you have a much more recent deformation history, and you have a thinner lithosphere. And so you would expect that that reacts differently than the East, which has older lithosphere and thicker lithosphere. So as you're pulling off ice from the last deglaciation, you would expect those two halves to react differently. And so some people have just started this work, and I think there's a lot more to be done about investigating this. Um, another thing we want to look at is sea level. So we just started a, a collaboration with David Holland's group at NYU, where they actually have ocean bottom pressure sensors. Uh, they're installing at the outlet of Highland and Waits Glacier. And so the, the question we want to ask there is, can we detect the mass change in the change in sea level off the coast? Because if you remove uh, ice from land, you're going to change the gravitational attraction of the sea to that ice. And so you should be able to detect that ice melt in the sea level change. Uh, Another thing we want to do is look at the Antarctica seasonal patterns like we're doing with Greenland. And so uh, Mike Bevis actually runs the network, most of the network, in Antarctica as well. So we're looking at some of those seasonal patterns and how that changes. And, and can we get a, a, a better time bracket on these precipitation events that are occurring? Uh, and the last thing we want to look at is the techniques that we're doing. And can we work with more raw grace data? Because the the missions themselves are going to be continuing in the future, so we want to make sure that we're improving our methods and doing the best job that we can with that. Um, and so my last slide here is sort of a, a why DTM slide, because I think that there are a lot of areas where we have mutual interest, and I think it opens up a lot of scientific possibilities. So the first one is that I've done some work on cratons and studying the lithosphere. And this is a problem that both impacts the solid Earth and impacts the cryosphere. And so, you know, there's a lot of open questions on how these continental keels, these thick lithosphere, how do they remain stable over time? And how does that difference in lithospheric strength impact our estimates of the viscous response of the surface? Um, another area is for other planets. All of the techniques that I've talked about today are applicable if you have any gravity or magnetic planetary field. And so, you know, we just sent essentially the GRACE mission to the moon. It was GRAIL, but it's essentially the same satellite. And we have a much better picture of the moon gravity field. And so you can start asking the questions like, can I localize on a specific crater and see how that crater formation impacts the gravity field uh, in a regional way? And Sort of another, the last area that I'm going to mention is just the deep Earth interior. Uh, because if you want to look at the gravity field, and you're looking at sort of the long wavelength features of the gravity field, those are really due to the dynamics of the lower mantle. And so it, it's, I think, a pretty interesting question on how the dynamics of the lower mantle impact the dynamics closer to the surface, and how is that expressed in the gravity field. So. It's just some areas where I think we have a lot in common, and I've enjoyed uh, the talks I've had today with people, and I'm uh, looking forward to meeting uh, the rest of you this afternoon. So uh, with that, I'll just uh, say thanks. There's a couple things that go into that measurement. Uh, basically, there, you can estimate the surface mass balance of the ice sheet from a climate model. And then when you combine that with a model of the discharge from those glaciers, you can get an estimate of the total mass. And so it's really the, the discharge that we, the discharge estimates that we have aren't that great because you basically have to go to uh, observe it. Right? So you have to go to the glacier to actually see, or you get really high resolution uh, satellite imagery, which we just started to get from like the GOI satellites and other stuff like that. So, and then you have a question of how good is the SMB model? 
the surface mass balance. Like it's basically here's the precipitation, here's my evaporation, or or and then here's the melt runoff. Like we don't have a, a good idea of how the melt runoff actually occurs. So my my view is that I, I make an observation, so I think that observation is great. It's better than I'm gonna say it's better than a model. <laughs> So in your list of what's missing, I mean, you just alluded to it and answer, alluded to it in the answer to your question. I mean, I read just in the popular literature, you know, these stories of, of, of water runoff at the bottom of, of, of the ice sheets as being really important to when they start galloping or, or you know, mm -hmm. have catastrophic losses. Do you have any way to measure that as far as I know? And is this just a local phenomenon that you can kind of integrate in the, in the, in the long range? Or do you have to actually, is there going to have to be measurements of, 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 of the traction loss of traction between the ice and the, and, and, and the land because of that water? Um, so because of the satellite imagery that we're starting to get, we have a pretty good idea of when the surface is melting and when the water pools. So I have a couple of So you know like when pools of water are forming on the surface. And we, we can see from satellite imagery how they drain into the ice sheet. But when they drain into a Mulan and go to the base of the ice sheet, like we don't have an idea of where it goes. I mean, it comes out, but, but the amount that comes out is not nearly the same as yeah. So it drains into these Mulans, and the amount that comes out in a river at the end near a town is not nearly the same amount. So there's been some work where you actually try to put uh, uh, tracer isotopes in this water and, and try and measure the concentration that you get out and infer how much is, is sticking back to the bottom of the ice sheet. And could you instrument acoustically, you know, or, or with some sort of measurement that could pick up vibrations, you know, a seismic measurement, I guess, you know, the flow of the water in, in, in some remote way that could kind of, you know, give you a chance to, to that I mean, the, once this happens, you know that it happens, but you want to know where you don't see it, you know, what, what's happening. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how large magnitude these events uh, generate in terms of seismicity. Um, we have a pretty good seismic network now, but it's only been up for a couple of years, and it's only been dense for a couple of years. Um, If you, I think a good way to do it, because these things happen on such a short, short time scale, is that these lakes form and then they drain really quickly, is that if you can actually GPS the surface of the ice sheet and catch one of these things. Um, so like someone I went to grad school did this for, um, blanking on the name of the gla Peterman Glacier in Alaska. So you actually GPS along it and so as the lake at the top drains, you can see that progression over the span of a day. Forming the yeah, it basically like inflating the, the tur surface of the glacier. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that would be something that I'm sure people are doing in Greenland as well. Yeah. So you mentioned that the uncertainty and the elastic response of the Earth then affects the measurement of the of the field gravity field. So what? I mean, what is? How does that uncertainty propagate into the mass loss over time measurement? What model you take for the elastic response? Um. So the, the model that we're using is, I guess at this point, 20 years old, and it's based off of PREM. So uh, by that I mean it has a constant lithospheric thickness in terms of measuring, or like generating the elastic response. So if you're in an area that has a really thick lithosphere versus a thinner lithosphere, uh, you're probably doing a, a poorer job of that. So, Basically, you're going to either remove or not remove enough of the elastic response, and so that's going to bias your mass change. And so it's probably going to be, it's not going to affect any of the acceleration, it probably would just affect the slope that we measure. But is it a 10% effect or a 50% effect? Or? Uh, I, I don't really have an idea because everyone's been using the same model 
the last 20 years. And it's, it's worth redoing that and doing it on a regional basis. Uh, yeah. Is it possible you could explain the differences in the sign of Uh, no, I, I don't think it's nearly that large. Alan? A couple of points, I guess. Uh, one, very early on, uh, when you were talking about the Stefan functions, is that the uh, I noticed in doing that, perhaps in the, I mean, in the attack of many women, that the patterns, your reds and moons, had the, uh, as sort of the appearance of the classic trade off and inversion, pluses and minuses canceling. So I'm wondering, Yeah, yeah, so we've done a lot of synthetics. So basically the, the point is that of slumping functions is that, is that you're representing the original field in, uh, you're, you're representing what the whole field looks like in a specific region. So we can take the original field and directly compare it to the new one that we're, we're generating in the slumping basis. And so that's one way to do it. Another way is we have a lot of synthetic tests. So we, we put on some mass change that we think is occurring on the ice sheet and do uh, a lot of different uh, uh, re-estimations of that. So you can add your own uh, colored noise, for instance, and then have an idea of how that is going to go into your estimate. Well, I guess, do, do you do this sort of equivalent to the size of tomographers do where they put in an artificial model with uh, significant changes, block models and stuff like that, yeah, yeah. their rays through it, get the arrival time Yeah, yeah, because we, you can take an image of what the mass change is, looks like from altimetry, and you can say, I'm going to just uh, uh, represent that in square harmonics, and then you can use that as your original field, and add some noise to it, and then do an estimation this way, and see if you get the same thing. Other point is that certainly in Iceland, our colleagues over there doing GPS in particular already have to correct for glacial unloading in terms of uh, looking at things that they're more particularly interested in more local stuff because of the glaciers and giving a significant amount of rebound right mm -hmm. now. So do you have comparable data like that in the other areas where you're working and can you or do you integrate this into the work that you're doing? Uh, well, the GPS networks sort of just started getting enough years of data in order to really... So the point of Mike's work was that they want to estimate the mass loss just from GPS and sort of just model the elastic response from current ice melt. And so if you look at some of the stations in Western Antarctica, for instance, they have the, the highest uplift rate of anywhere on the planet. They're, they're uplifting like uh, four centimeters a year. Is that? And so as that network gets more dense in Antarctica, he's, he, he'll be able to do the same thing that they did in Greenland. Oh, you can do that already. already. Yeah, yeah. So there are some people who, because the, they're trying to close the sea level budget by estimating the, the change in the gravity field using grace. And so that uh, is a group mainly out of UT Austin that does that. No, the, the data itself is band limited, and then our functions are also band limited. So they're band limited up to the same degree, uh, degree 60. And the, the reason that it doesn't go higher is because of the noise. So, um, so you're really are the way really high order stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And it's, it's mainly a, a problem with how you find out the location of the satellite. 
because you know the location between the satellites very well, but you don't necessarily know the orbit precise enough to get uh, those higher order square harmonics. Do you, do you happen to know how it is that Grail has managed to get higher degrees than that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're measuring a static field. So one of the things is that they're measuring a static field and they have like nine months of data with which to sum. The other thing is that their orbit is only 20 to 30 kilometers, or well, it was. It was the minimum. Yeah, yeah. So they, they don't have an atmosphere to worry about. And then, not only that, the last month or the last three weeks or something, they had an extra low flyby of like five kilometers on this little like section. And so that's kind of interesting because if you have satellite measurements at different altitudes, you can form different fields from those. So you have a, a really low resolution field from all of the data, and then you can form a, a localized high resolution field from just those low pass data. Um, but yeah, so they, they did the low pass, I think, to investigate a crater. I, I forget the name of it. Okay, any last questions for Chris? All right, uh, if you'd like to speak with him, there's a bit of time uh, between now and lunch. Um, otherwise, uh, let's thank him for his talk.